Okay, so hi everybody. It's a total pleasure to welcome you to the high point of my week and I hope the high point of your week to our weekly virtual biological physics and physical biology seminar. We are in for two total treats today. First talk by Guillermina Ramirez, Ramirez San Juan, who's just starting out at Brandeis University. And second talk from Moens Jensen from Niels Bohr. Um, you guys are all experts in the rules and we have also put them into the chat. So without further ado, I'm just handing it directly over to Guillermina. Please tell us about building order out of noise. Over to you. Okay, hi, Sri. I wanna first thank you guys for inviting me. I love the seminar, so it's a real honor to be able to speak here. So as you mentioned today, I'll be telling you about how a heterogeneous and disordered cilia carpet builds a directed clone. And then this is, like you mentioned as well, I just started my lab. It's been at Brandeis University for a month. So I'll be mainly telling you about work I did during my postdoc, and then I'll end with telling you more about work that I'm currently doing in my lab. So first, I want to show you where this inspiration comes from. In biology, we see that flows are generated by organisms across the tree of life. So even if you are a cell in a pond, you need to generate flow to swim. If you are a mouse or a human, you need to clear mucus from your airway. So you see that you also need to generate flow. And what's really remarkable for me is that all these flows are very different if you just look at the architecture, right? And then they occur in very different contexts. So this guy is swimming in water. Here we have flow, cerebrospinal flow going through the brain. But then what's really surprising is the biological unit that is able to generate all these flows is the same. So all these flows are generated by motile cilia. So here you see the cilia analog of the flows I just showed you for these three different examples. So here you can see that these little beating organelles are cilia. And then if you just look at an individual single cilium, if you look inside of it and the proteins that make that compose it, the, they are the same basically for all these different organisms. So a motile cilium is biologically the same entity in case you are a ciliated protease or if you are a mammalian airway or a flatworm. So that's what's really surprising. But from this videos, you can appreciate already that the structure of the how the cilia are arrayed and their contexts are very different. So I'm really interested in understanding these questions of how by having the same active unit, one cilium, but patterning in different ways, spatially and temporally, you can control the flow topologies that you generate and also be able to generate flows in very different fluid environments. So this is what my lab is interested in understanding, this relationship between cilia patterning and flow patterning. And another interesting point about this problem for me is this, this is inherently a multi-scale problem. So a motile cilium is a cellular organelle, so it's roughly around 10 to 20 microns in length. So we're talking, and then all the proteins that make up that cilium are at the nanometer scale, the motors that are actuating the microtubules to generate the cilia beads are nanometers in scale, but, but those organisms need to generate this flows at the centimeter scale. So I'm really interested in studying what happens in between as well. How do you connect these length scales? Because cilia organization, spatial and temporal, occurs at, at all these different length scales and it's tightly regulated in all these systems. So you can, if you have a motile cilium, you arrange them in a multiciliated cell. So multiciliated cells can have up to, from doses to hundreds of cilia. And then you have to think about how you locate them inside a cell, right? So the cilium has a polarity. So it has an active stroke and a recovery stroke. And then how it's anchored to the membrane, it's gonna determine where is the direction of the active stroke. So you can imagine that if you need to push fluid in the same direction and you have hundreds of cilia, you need to orient them in the same direction within a cell. Um, and then and if you further organization, so you have a tissue, you have hundreds and thousands of these multiciliated cells that you need, you have this little carpet, so you really need to think about how would I organize the cells in order to generate the flow I, the flow I need to achieve my biological function? Um, okay. there, yeah. sorry. Uh, there is a window covering the, uh, the right corner, bottom right corner of your slide. Oh, do you see it? I don't see it. Um, is this better? Mm -mm -mm. 
if you it's it's covering just just the right of your flow your 10 to the minus two meters flow box it's, right. oh just, just let me right try right and share this again maybe go for it um oh i know what it is okay here we go Is this better? Perfect. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So as I was just mentioning, uh, flows occur at very different length scales. And I'm interested in understanding the organization of each one of these length scales. But today, I'll focus this talk mainly on the scale of the multiciliated tissue. So I'll tell you about how the organization of multiciliated cells in the mammalian airway templates the flow that clears mucus from the airway. And here to appreciate the problem, I want us to stop and take a deep breath. So we're actually able to take this deep breath because the cilia inside our, inside our airway are doing exactly what you see in this picture. We have a bunch of multiciliated cells that are beating at approximately 20 hertz and they're clearing the mucus from our airway. And if you look at the structure of the airway, it looks something like this patchwork. We have multiciliated cells but we can't just have a continuous carpet of multiciliated cells. We need other cell types. So we have, among other secretory cells that are secreting mucus to create that protective layer that protects the airway from pathogens and other airway pollutants. And the cilia need to get rid of all of that, those pathogens and contamination. So they're beating like you see in this movie. And then the question that I was interested in understanding is how the patterning at this scale would actually generate this long range flow. Because as I mentioned, you have a carpet of cilia, but it's not continuous. And so we really need to think about how we organize this multiciliated cell so we can accomplish the function. So first I want us to, I want us to consider what types of organization might be relevant at this length scale. So here we have a cartoon of the trachea. And we, need to, we know we, know we need to move mucus from the lungs to the mouth. And we know we have a limited number of multiciliated cells because we also need other cell types. So to begin with, we know that our coverage fraction of the airway by multiciliated cells is gonna be less than one. Then it's really gonna matter how we arrange them. If we just put them at the beginning of the airway, just like in this cartoon, we might not get mucus to the end. But so then how we arrange them and how separated they are from each other, we're gonna call the wavelength in this talk, that's gonna be another important parameter. How do, you, what is the mean separation between these clusters of cells? And finally, as I told you at the beginning, so they have a polarity. Then you can imagine that if you need to connect the lung to the mouth, all the cilia need to be oriented relative to each other in the same direction and relative to this axis of the trachea as well. So we're gonna call that an orientation or polarity of every cell. So what I did was try to measure these parameters in an airway that we know the functions, so in the mouse airway, and just see what organization is built there in a biological system that is already being able to clear mucus. What I'll show you are some images of the entire trachea. So experiments I did were just basically dissect the whole trachea out of the mouse. To be able to image it, you cut it open along this axis, and then we look inside and see where are the multiciliated cells. So here you can see an image of the entire trachea of the mouse. This is all the, all these little green footprints are multiciliated cells. And if we zoom in, we can see that we have this patchwork pattern. So these green areas are multiciliated cells. These darker areas are areas where we don't have any cilia. So there is really, there are these gaps as we expected. And when we measure the cover attraction by multiciliated cells, what we see is this is a round point for So that was kind of surprising for me at the beginning because it's almost half full of holes and still it's able to generate this really centimeter scale flow. So that was kind of surprising. And I also wanted to measure the if there was any structure in this pattern. So then I just an took an autocorrelation of this pattern to be able to measure what's the mean separation or the wavelength between these clusters of multiciliated cells. And it turns out that it's around 16 microns. So that's around to three to four multiciliated cells in diameter. So even though your coverage fraction is relatively low from what I thought it would be, the separation between the cells is actually not too big. And 
Next, I'm gonna show you what happens with the orientation. So you can actually measure the orientation of the beating plane of a cilium from a fixed image because the structures that anchor the cilium to the membrane determine its polarity. So here you see a cartoon, this is the basal body and the basal foot, so the relative orientation is gonna determine the direction of the active stroke. And I'm gonna show you here how this looks like. So these are two proteins that mark these different structures. So here, what you have to do to measure the orientation of the cilium is connect the dots, basically. And, but already from this image, you can appreciate that if you connect the dots, you're not gonna get a polarity field that is oriented in the same direction. And we can zoom out at these different length scales and look at the orientation of all the cilia. This is a multi-cellated cell. So here in blue, we can see the cell outline. And then we can zoom out and look at hundreds of microns in the trachea as well and see what is the orientation of the cilia. So we connect the dots, like I just mentioned, we get this polarity fields. And indeed, what we saw just from looking at the images is true, that you see these defects in cilia orientation. And in retrospect, this makes sense because the shape of the cells is very irregular. So you're not gonna be able to pack all your cilia in the same orientation. And what, was I, what, what I was interested in was actually, what is the or organization, right? Is this very disordered, not so disordered? So, you can just measure an order parameter similar to magnetization to see how well oriented the cilia are relative to each other. And you see that there's quite a bit of noise in, inside a single cell. But if you average over individual cells and just look at the tissue scale, you do get some heterogeneity. But overall, there's still some global orientation of all the cilia beating planes. So what I just showed you is that there is actually quite a bit of heterogeneity in the structure and architecture of the mouse airway. So we have a coverage fraction that is around 0.4, so less than half of the surface of the trachea is covered by these multiciliated cells, but, and the, they're packed such that the gaps between them are around 16 microns, so that's three to four multiciliated cells. And there is also some heterogeneity in their orientation. So they are oriented relative to the AP axis of the trachea, but relative to each other, there are deviation in these orientations. So what actually happens with the flow in this case? When, so here I'm showing you a movie of some tracer particles, and, and then I just put it in, inside the, of the whole trachea. So here you can see the entire mouse trachea as well. And you can appreciate that is what, I, I what we would expect from a healthy area. We get this globally directed flow that goes from the lungs to the mouth. So even if we have this heterogeneous structure, we're able to generate this highly directed flow. So how do we do that? To understand how that was happening, we resorted to modeling. So we wanted to be able to pattern silly architectures at our will by varying these parameters that let the the separation between the clusters and the orientation of the multiciliated cells and ask what kind of flow topologies would we expect if we change these different parameters? And also how would that change the total flux and the clearance time? So since we're talking about the airway and its function is to actually clear particles, what becomes important is the clearance time. So if I drop a bunch of particles, how long would it take for these particles to clear this box? So that is a better proxy for airway function than actually the total flux. So since we're interested in large scale tissues, we can't really model every individual cilium. So we take an envelope approach where we introduce each multiciliated cell just as the slip velocity of the boundary with a defined orientation, defined by the orientation the, of the multiciliated cell. And then with this, we explore what happens with different flow architectures. So first I'm gonna show you what happens if we change this wavelength. And here, for, for the simulation purposes, we define this patchiness, which is the non-dimensional parameter that is a ratio of the wavelength and divided by the height of the fluid film. So here we see what happens. So, so here are our different patch of tissue. And in this case, we're keeping the coverage fraction constant. So we have the same number of multiciliated cells. So all that we're changing is how they, arra they are arranged in this carpet. So here we can see that if we just have one big cluster, as we would expect, we see this huge zones of recirculation emerge. So then if you're a particle and you're here, you're basically trapped forever, almost forever. And then as we start splitting this cover attraction into smaller and smaller regions, so we're decreasing effectively the wavelength, 
then what we see is that we get re rid of this recirculation zones. And actually, all, of, all over flow becomes positive. And then if we look at the total flux, it's the same for all these tissues because that's only going to depend on the cover attraction, which we said it was the same for all of these. But we do see that the clearance time gets reduced in cases where we have all the cilia divided, multi-cilated cells divided into smaller patches that are close together. Then I'll tell you also what happens with the orientation. So since we saw a surprising heterogeneity in the orientation, we were really interested in seeing what would happen if we have a little bit of noise in the orientation. So here we have a situation where we have a wavelength such that we see these regions of recirculation appear. So this could be hypothetically like our, our way we get rid of, you know, it gets injured all the time. We lose patches of multisolated cells. So this could happen all the time. And then, so here we see in all of these cases, we see these regions of recirculations. And here we're seeing what happens if we have perfectly crystalline order. So all, all of the cilia are oriented in the same direction. And what's kind of surprising is that as we introduce this order in the relative orientation of all the cilia, you see that we're able to connect these regions that were previously unconnected. So this kind of breaks open this regions of recirculations and connects the streamlines. And then actually it seems that the fluid is clearing particles more efficiently. But then you see that if you go too far, you basically break the global order. And then in that case, you just get this local patches where things get trapped. And when we look at a parameter sweep, we see that indeed we have a minimum for the clearance time where we have a little bit of disorder in the architecture of the airway. And if we look at the actual value of that minimum, it actually corresponds to what we measured experimentally. So this was really surprising, right? So this suggests that the airway actually has this heterogeneity to be more robust. So in case you have variations in your cover attraction locally or other things that may happen, then you're actually able to still clear particles efficiently. So this really suggests that even though it could be counterintuitive to have a heterogeneous cilia carpet to generate a highly directed flow. In this case, what we saw is that this heterogeneity, both in having these gaps and in having this slight misorientation of the cilia relative to each other, is actually really like well designed for, to achieve the function of the airway, which is to clear mucus across the entire trachea. So what I just showed you was data from the mouse. And then we were really intrigued by this idea of, okay, here, like, we know that the clearance time is going to depend only on these parameters very strongly. So this could hypothetically function for a giraffe, right? Because here, like, there's nothing about the length of the trachea itself. So I looked in the literature and images of multiciliated airway epithelium in different animals. And indeed, what you can see is that they all cluster along this region. So they all have around the same coverage fraction. And, but then also the patchiness so is really low. So all the cilia, the multiciliated cells are closely packed, very similar to the mouse airway. And this is kind of interesting that our phase diagram here has this little indent to the left, suggesting that by having this, ar this architecture really is able to deal with low coverage fractions, then those low coverage fractions are a biological need because you need other cells. That are, that are not multisolated cells also in your airway. So this was kind of really fun. So I always, when I give this talk, I tell people, if you see an animal or have an airway or a trachea of anything that's really out of this picture, it would be great if you can send it to me. And then, so with that, I wanna conclude this part of the talk. So what I told you about is how the architecture of a multisolated tissue gives rise to a flow that is optimized for the function and how orientation and coverage fraction are important control parameters in the case of the airway. But I told you at the beginning that this is really a multi-scale problem and we have patterning at all these different length scales that's gonna influence the architecture of our flows. And we have all these different parameters that could be contributing to the topology of the flow. And they happen at very different length scales. So what I'm doing in my lab is trying to address all these different parameters by studying different systems, but sy different biological systems where I can look similar to the trachea, uh, what is the patterning that is built in there 
and how would that give rise to its function? So I wanted to really follow up experimentally some of the results from the modeling, but in mouse, this is super cumbersome. You can't really straightforwardly change any of these parameters. So the way you would do it is deplete a protein and then get a phenotype, but then in mice that's really costly, but then planarians overcome all these limitations. So I'll show you why I'm studying planarians right now to try and vary these parameters and try to confirm some of the predictions from the models. Here I'm showing you the ventral surface of a planarian platform, which is basically a multicellular active carpet. So here you can see that it's almost completely covered by cilia. So the coverage fraction here is actually higher than the mouse airway. And then all of these cilia are beating. And the function of the ciliary carpet is to allow the worms to glide. So the cilia are beating, and there's also some gaps here where we have secretory cells where the cells are secreting mucus. So then the action of the cilia just moves the mucus so the worm can glide. And in this case in planarians, we don't have the problems with mouse because also we have a really easy readout for the function of the multiciliated cells. So in this case, we can just look at motility and then assess if the function of the cilia is correct or not. And here I'm showing you two examples where we have depleted two different proteins. And you can see that these worms have defects in motility. So instead of gliding smoothly, they start inching around. And if we look at the flows, we, it, what we see something that we expect, which is uh, some very different defects in the flows, but there's also something unexpected that even though the motility phenotype looks rather similar, the flow topologies are very different in these cases. And then when we look at the cilia, we can actually see that even though the macroscopic organism motility is changing in a similar way, it's due to very different causes. So here what I, what I saw first was that if we look at the cilia across the entire organism, this protein is actually changing the coverage fraction. And then as we expect, we get decreases in the flow velocity and overall connectivity. And this protein, interestingly enough, is not changing the coverage fraction. So we have normal cilia coverage fraction. But here what we see are difference in the cilia dynamics. So we think that the waveform here is changing. So this has to do more with temporal patterning. So this is something we're really interested in studying further to understand why we get this defect in flow. So another system that I want to tell you briefly about in this last few minutes that we're looking at is to understand patterning at the cellular scale and how would that affect the microscopic flow. So in this case, if we look at planarians, it's kind of hard as I showed you is the cells are really tightly packed there. So they're not an ideal system to look at the cellular scale patterning, but we have ciliated produce. So ciliated produce are just single cell organisms that you can find in your favorite pond. And what's really interesting from these organisms is that there's lots of natural variation already in the patterning of their cilia. Here you can see a few examples and here schematically you can see the patterning of the cilia. So these are unicellular organisms that are free living that have this really diverse patterning of cilia at their cortex. Um, Guillermina, you have three minutes. Great, I'm just about to conclude. So then if we just, and, and here you can also appreciate that the cilia, aside from their difference in spatial patterning, they also are highly patterned temporally. So I'm really interested in understanding how the cells are able to control within a single cell, right? This is a cell that has no brain, no nothing. How they're able to coordinate the cellular scale behaviors and coordinate their ciliary beating. So this is an ideal system to study that. And I'll show you a couple of examples specifically of this guy, which is Dibinium. So the idinium is really interesting because it's kind of the hydrogen atom of a cilia, ciliary arrays. It's, it only, it, it has two ciliary arrays, so two ciliary bands, as you can see from this. So it's relatively simple and they're also circles, so the geometry is great. And in this case, these two ciliary bands, in addition to the cilia being coupled hydrodynamically, they're also coupled by the cellular scale cytoskeletal network. So here you can see a picture of the centrum filaments that are connecting these two bands. So one question that we're addressing in the lab right now 
is how either this coordination of the cytoskeletal, how the coupling with the cytoskeletal or the hydrodynamic coupling will give rise to the metachronal waves that you see here. So metachronal waves are these patterns that occur because the cilia have a shift in the phase of their beating cycle. And then here you can see that the cell, we're looking first at the band traveling around the cell. And then as the cell lifts off from the surface, you can see there's a reversal. However, you still see this propagation of metachronal coordination. So we're really interested in understanding how this happens using the cells. So overall, hopefully I gave you a good picture of the things that we're interested in looking in the lab. Uh, we really love to study, so we would love to understand more aspects of this wonderful world of cilia and flow. And at every length scale, there is the perfect biological system to try and address all these questions. And with that, I want to conclude first thanking my postdoc lab. I had the best time ever doing my postdoc. I was a joint postdoc in the Prakash and the Marshall labs. And then all of the mouse work I told you about was done during my postdoc. And then I want to acknowledge especially Arnold Mathiasen. So he developed the simulations from the mouse work I showed. And he's a really awesome theoretical physicist. And he's going to be starting his lab at Penn next year. So also, I encourage you to look into his work. And then, of course, Manu and Wallace, like who have been super inspiring for everything. And I am current, I want to advertise that I'm currently recruiting grad students and postdocs. So if you're interested in any of this work, feel free to get more information at our at our website. And thank you. Well, thanks for the terrific talk, Guillermino. Um as <clears throat> um, may, there are many, many, many questions, and I'm going to read a selection of them and get to the rest of them in the informal discussions. Sure. Um, first, a clarifying question from Navish Vadva early on. Um, sorry, just trying to find the right wording of the question. This is from 11, um, 12. Did you image the flows in a living mouse, or is this trachea taken out of the mouse? So this trachea is taken out of the mouse. So like I said, instead of having the 3D reconstructions, and this happens really fast. So the way I did it was to do it 2D, basically. You have the pipe, you cut it open, then you look at it. Super. So uh, I'm going to follow up with a different question from Navish um, from Levin. Sorry from, <laughs> there are a few different ones, so I, I got confused for a minute. From 1119, how does the mucus rheology affect the cilia-driven flow? Does it matter that mucus is a complex fluid full of polymers and other particles? Yeah, so that's the next question, right? So ideally, we would want to explore that. So what we did is in the simulations, our, we added a little bit of viscoelasticity. And then that didn't matter for, we still saw this effect that by having this organization, we still reduce the clearance times, but that's gonna matter a lot as well. So mucus has a very complex rheology as well. So another aspect that we, will, we would be interested in understanding later in the future is actually the finding, what is the rheology of the mucus here and how would that, would everything be different? They would have the complexity. Super. Question from Rudra Biswas at 1117. Is there a natural physiological length scale corresponding to the fluid flow? Um, what, can you clarify that? So why don't we get into that in the discussions? Okay. <laughs> I'll give Rudra a chance to clarify what he means then. Uh, let's jump to a question from Nancy Ford at 1118. Can you tell us about the one creature, maybe a worm that looks to have a much larger patchiness than the others? I think this is towards the end of the first part of your talk. Oh yeah, so planarians, like this guy. I think just before this, Nancy, do you want to quickly jump in and clarify? It was on the plot uh, that you showed that oh, all the was clustered and there was yeah. one that wasn't. I see what you mean. Yeah, so that was a snake right here. We don't actually understand what's happening there. So I looked and it was the only one that seemed to have an unusually high separation between cilia clusters. And I think snakes have a really, really long airway and overall have different physiology. 
and most mammals, but I really, yeah, so that was, that's still a puzzle, understanding why that is so different. Okay, so jumping next to a question from Sartha Gupta at 1120. Um, is this the most efficient way to clear mucus? Have you found a better way than nature in your parameter sweep? Uh, well, it, it's going to depend, right? Because you can play with the parameters and it depends what, if, what you mean by efficiency. But I think in terms of robustness, this is the best way, right? If you control for, if we're variations in the coverage fractions and things like that, this is probably overall the best way within, of course, your limitations in this case. Great. Uh, wrapping up with a final question from Suraj Shankar and everybody else will get to your questions during the discussions. Um, so Suraj's question is from 11.22 AM. He asks, the optimal heterogeneity in polarization is interesting. Do you have ideas on how a system can reproducibly generate a partially ordered ciliary pattern? Is there any evidence of me mechanical feedback in controlling ciliary orientation and organization? Uh, yeah, so there's lots of things there. So first of all, there's the, there is feedback from external fluid flow. So it's really, here, everything I showed you was once the pattern is already established, but to establish that pattern during embryonic development, there is some evidence that the orientation, when this orientation of the cilia is being set, uh, it can be set by an external fluid flow. So then we think, people think that, okay, as the cilia beat, they kind of self-reinforce an orientation. And then in addition to that, there are cytoskeletal networks at the cell cortex that are coupling all the cilia and you see the supracellular fibers that are aligned, but we don't really know what's the significance of that. And then there's planar cell polarity that like one cell signals to the next. This is the overall orientation that's doing that. And in addition to that, there is steric interaction. So the cilia are, are completely packed in the surface of the cell. And then people have shown that overall, they always like to this really high packing. They, no matter the cell size, they always optimize for having this number of cilia per cell or per area. So then in that case, there's also the steric interactions, I think in this case, that it's limiting, you know, you, you can be disorganized, but you can't be totally different if, from your neighbors. So there's all of that. Super. Thank you so much. Once again, uh, Gear Mina for a terrific talk and for all of these interesting discussions. Um, 